All right. God bless you. And welcome to Live with Brad Sullivan. Uh, I am so delighted that you're tuned in tonight. I'm Pastor Brad Sullivan of Surge Church. I'm repping, I'm repping our Surge Church gear and uh, here in Mobile, Alabama on the Gulf Coast and with Brad Sullivan Ministries where we travel and minister. And I love uh, God's people, love the church, love his word, love to preach the word of God, love to teach it, love to study it. And that is why we are so tuned. We're so excited that you tuned in on a Thursday night to join us. And I'm very excited to have with me my dear friend, Pastor Fred Price Jr. of Crenshaw Christian Center from Los Angeles, California. Pastor Fred, thanks for taking the time and being with us tonight, man. Absolutely. I'm uh, honored and privileged to share this time with you, uh, my dear brother. And you know how our conversations can go if, if only the people could be a fly on the wall. This is but true. I'm excited about this tonight. Right. So I, I, I was just noticing I'm repping Surge Church, but come on, man, you're repping all of L.A. You got Kobe behind you. So, uh, <laughs> that's... yeah, Kobe's my guy. You know, uh, of course, the tragic oh. situation earlier this year, but he, he's still he's still he's still my number one player. So. No doubt. I was in Ecuador actually preaching, coming home from a, coming back to the hotel from a service when my, my, my phone alerted me. And I just, it's like your heart sunk, you know, couldn't even believe the news. But, uh, my goodness. But hey, anyway, hey, Pastor Fred is coming from Los Angeles, LA, and I am coming tonight from LA, lovely Alabama, uh, in particularly lower Alabama. So from the West Coast to the Gulf Coast, man, we got you covered. And so, uh, again, Pastor Fred and I, how are you today, Pastor Fred? You and I have been friends now, I think we met in 2015, so five years uh, we've been friends, and uh, you know we yes. have a lot in common uh, around the same age. Uh, we're both pastor's sons. We both pastor the church that our fathers founded, and we pastor the churches that our fathers founded, and our fathers are still a part of the church and the ministry, which I think is is also unique. But I think most of all, what really bonded us was when we found out that we have a, a similar interest in the things that we love to study. So we've been, we, we go on and on when we're together from angels, fallen angels, giants of the Bible, the supernatural, but all of these topics are so powerful to really understanding God's word that you really don't hear much about. Can you hear me? Oh, it just dropped out. You say it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Subject we don't we don't hear much about, and then it froze for oh, a second. I'm sorry. I was just saying that you know those are the topics you know that you and I have really bonded over the years. We found out that we study the similar things like giants and the angels and fallen angels. And yeah. Oh no. It's. Um, I mean, it was very interesting. You know that. Uh, you were interested in those same things. So I, that's the main reason, or one of the main reasons that we hit it off. I mean, I remember being in the foyer. Uh, you were giving us a tour of the building. And I think it was a, a DVD or a thumb drive teaching mm -hmm. on, was it Angels or Nephilim? It was one of the two. Right. Anyway, like that's it. really what sparked the conversation. And then from there, we went from Angels to Nephilim, the UFOs to Atlantis, I'm, just all kinds of places uh but right there in with the scripture being at the heart of it so right absolutely these aren't wild crazy you know people you hear the word a lot today you know conspiracy theories but really i mean there's a difference between conspiracy theories and conspiracy facts and these things that really help um shape the bible and, and bible understanding far more than what i think people realize right yeah hey, so, so so, and you've written a new book real quickly. We'll, we'll say to the audience, uh, Behind the Scene, and it's, uh, it's, it's in relation to all those things. Absolutely. Behind the Scene. I deal with pop culture, uh, demons, angels, spiritual warfare, uh, the subject matter we love talking about. Yeah. So how would people get, that, get your, a copy of your book? They can get it from thematrixoftruth.com. Uh, also, Every Christian Faith. So faithdome.org or via our social media pages. And then also Amazon. Uh, it's on Amazon Kindle. So Amazon is digital only, but you mm -hmm. can get it that way as well. All right. Well, hey, you know what? And all proceeds go to First Lady Angel Price. Uh, <laughs> just trying to get, I'm just getting a regalia. 
Angel and Bella. Everything goes to Angel and Bella. Yeah. Yeah, the ladies, they always take it over. Hey, so we're, we're also talking about a very important topic tonight that I think is so in uh, apropos to the situation that's, that we're in now. Uh, Pastor Fred, we're talking about understanding the end time. And this is a topic that I love so much uh, because it's just a part of the, the teaching of the Bible. Uh, you really can't preach the gospel without an understanding of the fact that not only did he come, but he's coming again. And so we want to just take this time tonight in this uh, part one of our, of our discussion on understanding the end times and talk about a few things. And hey, for those of you that are watching, again, we thank you for tuning in. And if you have questions, just comment in the, in the Facebook feed and we'll do our best at the end to try to answer some of those. But we do ask that you um, keep your questions to things that are related to what we're talking about tonight. But I want to just start, Pastor Fred, with a passage because, you know, when you're in crisis moments, like where we're dealing with, with coronavirus and COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, a lot of people are troubled by that. And it makes people think about, are these the end times? Are we living in the tribulation? And so I think it's important for us to, you know, as, as preachers and teachers to really uh, help people have a better understanding of what the Bible says about end times. But most of all, is not let your heart be troubled. Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwellings. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there may you be also. So we know that in troubled times, we don't have to be troubled because as believers, we have the promise of the Lord's return for his people. But, you know, Pastor, what I wanted to get tonight is really talk to you about, you know, in crisis times, it's funny how people's minds, even not just Christians, but even people of the world, you know, their minds will often go to apocalyptic uh, uh, ideas or are, are these the last days? Or is this the end of the uh, is this the end times? Is this the end of it all? And you know what? A recent poll found that 31% of Americans felt this current crisis is a wake-up call. And in that poll, 43% of Protestant Christians felt like this was a wake-up call. So we see that people are aroused. And when people are aroused and they think about the end times, what's unfortunate is that so many people today have such a uh, lack of understanding about what the Bible really says about the end times that it leads them to different ideas that may or may not be true simply because they, they don't have that grounding. And, and maybe they're scared of talking about the end times, but I don't think there's a topic that's more exciting and faith inspiring than Bible prophecy and end times. I concur. I concur. And I believe it's important. Uh, uh, three different New Testament writers, when we look at Peter after the day of Pentecost had fully come, and there was a, a select group of those downstairs who said, ah, oh, they're just full of new wine, you know, mocking. And Peter said, no, no, it's only the third hour of the day. He said, this is what Joel prophesied. That's right. And, and Joel, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands, hundreds leading to thousands of years before uh, Peter made that statement, Joel said, and he prophesied it, uh, in, in, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's what Father God said. And Peter said, this is that day. Mm -hmm. So from day one of the church, we've been in the last days. John even writes in his epistles, we are in the last hour. That's right. and, and Jude said, this is the last time. Mm -hmm. So since the early days of the church, we have been in the final days. So how relevant is it today? It's been relevant for close to 2,000 years. That's right. Absolutely. And you know, Peter said in that, that, uh, hey, one day is as a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years as a day. And here we are coming up on Pentecost Sunday, 2000 years ago, the church was born. So we're celebrating a 2000 year old birthday, but really in the eyes of God, it's only like two days. And so uh, that's right. True. And uh, you know, Peter said that God's not slack concerning his promise, which he was talking about the promise of the rapture and the Lord's return. And he asked some count slackness. And he said, in the last days, scoffers will come and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? Nothing has changed. And so, you know, one of the signs of the times is that attitude, that scoffing attitude that nothing has changed. You know, that when's he, people have been saying that since I was a kid, that he's coming back and nothing has changed. Right. Yeah. So, and, and the mocking, I would say also, uh, th those are signs of the times is there, there are numerous signs and most of the time we're looking for something cataclysmic you know we're, we're 
thinking about the words of Jesus in Matthew uh, 24, you know, when he talks about wars and rumors of wars, and we've had wars, we've had rumors of wars, or heard rumors of wars, and all of the other signs, pestilences and, and earthquakes, you know, inclement weather, uh, scarcity, all of that, all of those are signs. But like you said, scoffers, signs as well. Mockers, signs as well. That and complacency, you know, as it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. You know, Noah wasn't just building an ark for 100 years. He was also preaching for 100 years to his generation. Since he was a preacher of righteousness. Right. And he preached for 100 years with no one really responding to him. And uh, they just blew him off. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, it's amazing how when you try to war give people godly warnings, you it gets chalked up to, even among some in the church, as just, oh, that's just conspiracy theories. That's just crazy stuff. Well, you know what? Noah was considered a conspiracy theorist of his day. But, right. <laughs> you know, he was when the, when the, when the uh, ark door closed and the flood started, you know, we had to be like, how do y'all like me now? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> of course. Of course. Hey. And, that, and the ark is uh, an account, a type and shadow of uh, the catching away, you know? So, uh, and people don't consider those types and shadows that which led to Christ and leads us to where we are uh, right now. So, um, you know, it, it's always an exciting subject. Uh, people are intrigued by the idea of apocalypse. They're intrigued by the idea of, you know, the great battle or the great war, the sky cracking, the trumpet sounding, angels, demons. I mean, it, it, it is exciting. It's, it's special effects on 10. You know, what, what an ideal script for a blockbuster epic summer movie. Uh, but for us, it's real. Those of us who uh, believe in the word and believe in the Christ. And like I said, you know, moments ago, it is, it is a relevant message. It was relevant then, it's relevant now. There's never a time or a day where this message is irrelevant. That's right. So, hey, let's get into it then. Tonight, what we're going to talk about is three things. We're going to talk about why understanding the end times is important. Because again, crisis moments, like we're seeing a global pandemic, has got people shaken. Uh, and they're thinking about things that they don't often think about. They think about their soul. They think about salvation. They think about eternity. They think about the end times. Uh, and and uh, we also want to talk about tonight the difference between, I think this is huge, the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. And so we also want to talk about, uh, there's people who have questions, you know, are we in the beginning of the tribulation? So first of all, I want to just talk real quickly about, uh, let's dive into that, that, that. I just have some notes here. I was just wanted to uh, highlight, but I want to talk about, uh, first of all, answering that question of, of understanding the end times. Why is that important? Understanding the end times. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's vitally important because, um, you know, it has to do with us. You know, it has to do with uh, the church. You know, and, and Jesus said on this rock, I'll build my church against it. So, and that's the first time that he uttered the word Ecclesia regarding his people. Mm -hmm. And uh, he proclaims victory from, from, from the beginning. I mean, he proclaims victory for the church before the church is officially established. Because, of course, you know, Acts is the history of, of the church being established. So, you know, if we, have, if we have the victory, yet Paul says fight the good fight of faith. So we know we're in a fight. He tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So we know warfare is going forth. We, we, we know there's combat. Jude says contend for the faith. So we know that there's a, there's a, a back and forth. There's a struggle, but we do know that we win. And, and, and part of that victory is, you know, what we refer to as the rapture or, or, or being caught up. And, and you're right. There needs to be some clarity on uh, the church being raptured. And yes, we know that word rapture is not uh, in the Bible, but you know, you, you get the idea, you, you understand what the concept is. Um, but you know, what, what, what does it mean for the church to be raptured and how, how does that differ from, you know, Christ's returning? Reading, you know, Revelation 19, not to jump ahead too far, but scripture says, you know, he's coming on a white horse. He's right. coming to judge and make war. So, you know, what does that mean? When does that happen in relation to us being caught up? What's the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment? I think these are questions that should be addressed. Yeah. So, hey, we're talking about, first of all, why understanding the end times is important. And, you know, you and I were talking the other day, we, were, we grew up in 80s church. Come on, we were 80s church kids. And, you know, you know, we, we were growing up, you would hear about, hey, Jesus is coming back. And if you, if you think about it today, uh, and you go to church gatherings, or, or you, you're in services, when's the last time you went to a church service and heard a preacher get up and actually say, 
Jesus is coming back. I mean, those are themes that you really don't hear. But I would just say one of the reasons why, and this is great for the audience to, to, to know this, one of the reasons why it's so important to understand the end times is because you can't understand the full gospel message with, without it. Because we don't understand that the gospel is that Jesus came, he was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life, he died as a substitute for our sin, he was buried for our um, justification, he was raised for our glorification. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He poured out his spirit uh, on the church so he could carry his ministry forth in the earth. But hey, there's another point that he is coming back for his church. And that is a critical component of the gospel that we have to make sure that we're still teaching in the church today so that people have this sense that, hey, you know what? I need to be living not for this age, but for the age to come because uh, Jesus is coming back. Yeah. So as you, you made an a, a interesting statement. You said he's at the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, the psalmist, David, said in the 110th Psalm, he said, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Uh, in Hebrews, the writer says, from that time, from that time, he's seated at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Uh, Pastor, what, what do you how do you relate that to uh, his coming and the rapture of the church? Well, I think that, um, you know, when God, Jesus first came, he did not break up Satan's kingdom. Satan is still the God of this world. But uh, when he returns, you know, he came first as a suffering servant, but in his return, he's going to come as a conquering king. In his first coming, Jesus came to conquer the greatest enemy, you know, a great enemy. And that was, uh, sin and its reign over mankind. But when he returns in his second coming, you know, the Bible calls it the second coming of the Lord and, and the Old Testament prophets likened it to the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, it's a great day, but for God's enemies, it's going to be a dreadful one. And that's when he's coming on the white horse. And so I think that it's at that day, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Christ the Lord. They'll be forced to confess it at his appearing. And so I, I think that that is the process of God making, you know, his enemies, his footstool. So that means, and, and, you know, we talked about this yesterday and you shared something with me. I had, I had never considered it. So it was very illuminating for me. So that would then mean that there, there is something that happens from the time that he sat down until he returns on that horse. There's something that happens in between regarding us. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, when he says, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first? Absolutely. Well, you see the church age being born, carrying on the ministry of Christ, and then the rapture of the church that uh, is going to occur before the return of, of Christ, uh, before his re actual physical return to the earth. And so, absolutely. You know, I think, uh, and we're skipping ahead to uh, the difference between the rapture and the second coming, but... Um, you know, obviously in the, in the rapture, you know, he's coming for the church in the second coming, he's coming with the church, uh, to, uh, at the end of the tribulation to defeat the Antichrist. And that's, that's just an important delineation to make in people's understanding about the end times is that there's a difference between the rapture and the, uh, and the second coming. Yeah, I, th I think, I think it's, it's, it's fitting that, that we are discussing it now because, you know, there are believers that say we will be here during the tribulation. Right. We're, 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 we're going to be present. And so they don't see us out of here before that happens. Right. You know, some or the trib or post trib seven years of it, that, that the church will be, you know, experiencing that. So, um, so I, that's why I think it's important that, and, and I think that's a part of understanding uh, the end times is the, the difference between, you know, his coming uh, and, and his appearing when he's receiving his church. Right. And let me just for the audience sake and for any pastor or teacher that's or minister that's watching. And the reason why it's so important to understand the end times, help people understand the end times uh, and to be able to, uh, to preach it and teach it and a motivation to want to preach it and teach it is because, you know, there's approximately 109 prophecies in the Bible concerning Jesus's first coming pastor. But get this, there is 329 prophecies and references to Christ's second coming. So we see that there, uh, the Bible mentions Christ's second coming 
220 more times than it does his first. first. So you see an exorbitant amount of difference in what it's talking about. Building an expectation, hey, you've got to live for this day that's coming. And, you know, 28% of the Bible was Bible was prophecy when it was given. So that means that over a quarter of the Bible is Bible prophecy about what has things that have already been fulfilled and things that are still awaiting to be fulfilled. And I think that when you look at the church today, you see very much less than a quarter of the preaching on these things. But we still have to have a healthy balance in our teaching so that people understand. And I want to say this, this is amazing, man. Um, the church age you were talking about earlier is 2000, for, it's about 2000 years between the day of Pentecost and now, right? But the seven year tribulation is only seven years, so a much shorter time period than the 2000 church, year, church age that we're in. But here's what's crazy. When you look at the, the amount of space that the seven year tribulation takes up in the Bible, it's second only to the life of Christ. Mm. And so, yeah. That is a major topic that the apostles talked about that, you know, we still today need to have a place for teaching this stuff so that people have a working understanding. You know, 216 chapters of the New Testament contain 318 references to Christ's second coming, which means one out of every 30 verses provides us with this hope and this assurance that, hey, this thing is going to take place in, in our future. And, and, and that's exciting. And lastly, real quickly, Pastor, Paul, in his 13 epistles, he mentioned baptism 13 times, right? And not all of those were associated with water baptism. He mentioned right. communion two times, but he mentioned the coming of the Lord 50 times. And so we see such a, uh, um, a difference in how the apostles talked about these things compared to what we see today. And I think that's why there needs to be a, uh, not a running away from uh, teaching on the end times or not chalking it up to end time conspiracy. We need to realize, hey, this is an exciting part of the Bible that the early church, uh, speaking of the early church and the apostles, they spent a lot of time teaching on. They did. And it's interesting that the uh, apostles, I mean, they opened up uh, Acts chapter one is, is opening up with them asking when will Israel be restored? I mean, so they're like, okay, so when's the end? Are, are we, are we, how close are we? That's right. And he said, you know, not for you to know the times and the seasons rather here's what you need to be focused on <laughs> waiting until the Holy spirit comes upon you. So you can be a witness for the kingdom, you know, and then go forth and preach the gospel and make disciples of nations, et cetera. So uh, it, it, you know, all, all of the, the stats, all of the things that you've highlighted, um, it, it should cause, you know, believers to, you know, really, really pay attention to uh, what the Bible is saying about the end and how important and how vital it is for us to be, and I like to say it like this, as well-educated, you know, as we can. The Bible says we know in part, we see in a mirror dimly, and I always say I'm grateful for the part that I do know, but I'm always reminded of how much I don't know, Absolutely. and so when it comes to uh, this subject matter, you know, I've always said I have this, I have this relationship with eschatology where, you know, I'll be, I'll be believing one thing and then I'll read a commentary or I'll talk with the fellow pastor. And I, then I start to question what I originally believed about something. So uh, I can imagine how many believers feel the same way. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, I was going to say too, you know, Paul's first book of the Bible was first Thessalonians and in all five chapters, he mentions the return of the Lord. And even in chapter four details how the rapture is going to take place in sequence. And so um, this, is, this is a huge topic in the New Testament. And people say, well, why do I need to talk about the end times? Why do we need to preach on that? Why do we need to teach on that? Well, I would say, why not? Because the Bible does such, has such emphasis on it. But like you said, we have to always be thirsty for knowledge. We have to always want to grow in our knowledge. And hey, sometimes when you're dealing with prophecy and imagery, you have to be willing to like, hey, you know, I might not have been correct about this. You know, you've got to be flexible in some of the things that, that, we, that we read in Scripture. So you mentioned First Thessalonians. So I think that would be an, uh, a, a good place to uh, draw our attention to. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, chapter 4, verse 13, you know, when he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep. Now, uh, throwing in uh, Romans 14, 10 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10, where Paul says, you know, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I was always taught that, uh, or I'll say probably over the past 10 years, 
uh, I've been exposed to teachings that uh, articulate uh, that's where the church is headed. You know, the banner, the reward bench, the judgment seat of Christ. And that's kind of kind of in sync with come hither in the beginning of, of Revelation chapter four. What, what are your thoughts on that? So you kind of broke up a little bit there. Could you repeat that apart about about the judgment seat? Yeah. So um, so I, I was I would say over the past 10 years, the teachings or eschatological teachings that I've been exposed to um, have articulated that uh, the, the saints, the church will. Um, we will head to the Bema, the reward bench, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. And, and that's in sync with, you know, come hither in the beginning part of, of Revelation chapter four. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is that, would you say that's, that's what Paul is, is talking about in first? So we're having a little connection issue, but, um, you know, I obviously think, you know, Paul said it's appointed to all men once to die and then face the judgment. But if you are, if we're believe, if we're believing God and we are faithful to God in our lifetime, when we do face the judgment, you know, uh, we're going to, it's not going to be a judgment of consequence. It's going to be a great reward. And I do think that because then Paul said in first Thessalonians four, that um, we who uh, the dead in Christ are going to rise first and we who remain will be caught together to to meet the Lord in the air. And it's at that point that the Lord is going to lead us into the presence of the father. And we're going to be giving our, we're going to face the judgments and, and the rewards of what we've done in this life. Yeah. Uh, John said in first John four seventeen, and this is a, a scripture that really, you know, resonates with him, with me, but he says, love has been perfected in us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And so I believe many Christians think that that's a scary day. Right. Some may even think that's a day in which I find out if I get in. And I tell saints all the time, look, if you're at the Bama, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, great. You're, you're in. If you're gathered together in the air, you, you're good. You're good. Right. You're good. Now, plus, I was rereading the other day, it said you're going to give an account for every idle word. And I was like, well, we need to read past that one. But uh. right. <laughs> right. Right. But. Um, uh, when he's writing to the, to the Corinthian church, he adds a little more specifics to the judgment. He says, he says, and we'll give account for the deeds done in the body. Mm -hmm. And he says, whether good or bad. And sometimes I wonder if believers, when they read that bad part, are they nervous? And that's still not something to be nervous about. Right. Right. You know, hey, if we, let's just say it this way. What is the rapture? The rapture itself is a reward. You know, the rapture is a reward. And so if you're raptured, then praise God, then that means you've been faithful. You've been an overcomer because the promise of the rapture, you know, and, and this is a question, is it to all Christians or is it to a specific, you know, I mean, we can wear a Christian label. Anybody can wear a Christian label, but a true believer is a disciple of Christ and he's devoted, you know, at all times throughout his life. And, and we see in the letters to the seven churches in Revelation, it, it, repeatedly in each letter, it said, this is for the faithful. This is for the one who overcomes. And so if we have that faith and faithfulness that's overcoming in life, we make it to the rapture. That is the reward. You know, the rapture is a reward. And therefore, you're going to be rewarded for uh, your faithfulness and overcoming faith in God. Um, and I, I don't think that's a question. So, Pastor, can you open that up some more? Because that was new to me when I first heard it, that when the church is raptured, not everyone who professes Christ as Lord will. I'm just throwing that out up. there. I'm just throwing that out there, you know. Okay. But, you know, is there, is there would you say that the, the seven letters – kind of point to that like that's what we could read and meditate on well you know to come to an understanding that only those who overcome well you know it's interesting uh when you read it you almost get that feeling you know you almost get that sense uh in revelation the, the seven letters uh because you know you have the seven churches and they're likened to the seven golden lampstands of the menorah right and so it's kind of like the right. church filled with the god spirit is the menorah to the world what the menorah did in the old testament was lit by the anointing oil 
to light and illuminate the holy place. The church is God's menorah right. today that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, that's why Pentecost is so important as we're coming up on Pentecost Sunday. The anointing of the Spirit in the church causes us to be like the menorah of God to a dark world. But uh, he only blessed two of those churches. He rebuked five of those churches and was calling them to repentance. Uh, and the only reason I just threw that out there is because, you know, firstly, I'm not God, so I'm not going to be give the one giving the judgments at that seat. But it's almost like you get that sense that he keeps repeating those same lines over and over again in those same letters that, hey, the overcomer to the faithful one. And so I, I think that we have to make sure that throughout all the seasons of our lives that we're, that we're faithful and that we're overcoming and that we're not, we're not overcome by the things of this world. And so it, it really gives you that sense that the promise of the rapture is to those who've been faithful to the end. Yeah, that, that. That's not questioning somebody's salvation. I think it's just delineating and distinguishing between someone who just wears a Christian label and someone who's really, you know. Right, I was, I was reading, because I'm teaching on Revelation at my Tuesday night Bible study and we were just reading about the church at Smyrna, mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 2, 8 through 11. And so there are some interesting words at uh, the end of that letter where he says, you know, he says, listen, I'm giving you the heads up. Satan's going to throw some of you in prison mm -hmm. and you're going to have tribulation 10 days. That's right. He says, remain faithful till the end and then he says he who overcomes now i gotta be honest this this one has it's baffled me for some time i feel like i have maybe a little more clarity on it but he says he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death and i'm thinking well wait a minute not jump to, but but in relation 20 and 21 it's pretty clear what the second death is so is he talking about the same thing there? And, and why would he tell believers that the second death could, could, could be an issue for them? Because I'm thinking in, in my mind, if, if I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm saved. And, 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 and I mean, the Holy Spirit convicts when, when, when sin comes. And if he's not convicting, then, then maybe I'm not actually saved. But if I am saved and that conviction comes and I'm, I'm making my aim to uh, you know, live, live according to the word as best as I possibly can, then, then what does it mean when he's saying he who overcomes, because it implies that there may be some that do not overcome. And if there are those that do not overcome, what is their relation to the second death, which appears to be the lake of fire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. Right. Or uh, those who have an opportunity to overcome as they move forward in the tribulation in the event that someone misses the rapture, you know, that, uh, you, 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 you realize that, hey, you know what, I'm going to overcome this time, which will be much more difficult to do. <laughs> then that's why it's always, it's better to serve the Lord while it is day, the Bible says. You know, that'll be much more difficult yeah. time. But still, I, I think that there, we obviously know there's going to be a remnant uh, that's going to be saved in the tribulation. And I think that's one of the things that when you know, people are talking about pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation rapture, you know, they think about, well, what look, you see the elect or you see the saints in the, in the tribulation. Well, we got to realize there's three categories of saints. There's Old Testament saints. John the Baptist was the representative of the last one. Uh, Jesus said that he's the greatest man ever born of a woman, but the least in my kingdom are greater than him. Right. So he, he represents the last Old Testament saints and a new dispensation comes with the church. They have the New Testament uh, saints, but then you have the tribulation saints. And those are the ones that will overcome and they will, many of them will be martyred. Uh, but they will hold. They'll they'll realize that they'll hold fast. They will not turn to the antichrist, and they will they will uh, uh, choose to serve the Lord. Yeah. So how do we? How do you bring comfort to believers? You know that don't they don't want to get left. I mean, they're like I I believe in I believe in Jesus. You know, how do I know if I'm one of the overcoming ones? Right. But I think that it's not like you said. It's not a scary thing. Um, that's why I think talking about the end times is so important because there's a motivation in it. You know, that's what Peter said. Hey, you know, don't, don't be deceived by the scoffers that are going to come. God is in slack concerning his promise and he's not willing that any should perish. He, he doesn't want you to perish. So I, I don't think it's a matter of just getting in by the skin of your teeth. Uh, I, I think it's a matter of 
uh, understanding that we're not living for this age, we're living for that one to come. And because of that, there ought to be a motivation in, in, in our lives to say, I'm going to stay faithful to the Lord. I'm not going to have one season in, one season out. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord to the end, no matter what I face. And uh, you know what? God's going to reward that just like he rewarded Noah. You know, I mean, Noah, he stayed with it to the end and he was faithful and he overcame in the face of tremendous odds. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it's not scary. Uh, it's such a, it's such a blessing uh, because uh, we know that Paul said, God hasn't appointed us for the wrath that is to come. And those are words of comfort. So really the rapture are comforting words. They're not, they're not uh, discouraging words, but I just would encourage people that it ought to motivate you to, hey, come on, let's serve God. We're going to serve God all the days of our lives. Amen. Amen. Hey, Pastor, I want to transition into like what we we're talking about earlier, and that is the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming. You kind of get into the second topic that we were that we set for tonight. And, um, you know, you and I, again, we're talking about 80s church and growing up in, uh, as kids during that time. And you know, we heard a lot about Jesus is coming back and you heard a lot about the rapture of the church. But I think what happened was, is that because those two things kind of get lumped together, the rapture and the second coming, you just have this idea that they're the same thing. And so it really causes confusion for people. So when they're reading like what Jesus said in Matthew 24 about the signs of the end, and they, they have a hard time distinguishing what is what, because they've been under this impression that these two things are just the same thing. Yeah, um, I always thought, or for the longest, especially when I was in Sunday school and, and growing up, I thought it was the same thing myself. So I can only imagine how many uh, believers, you know, felt the way that I felt. It wasn't until I got exposed to uh, the teachings of Dr. Hilton Sutton that I found out that there was a difference. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that he got everything right. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but uh, I probably... of uh, Revelation in the book of Daniel from his team. And you, so how, how would we, how, how would you say that we could show believers in scripture that there is a difference between the two? Right. Where, where would you take them well, in the yeah, word? Let, let's first just, you know, if we can for, for the audience sake, we could just go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18 and read the sequence of events of how Paul describes the rapture. You got to realize, you know, the Old Testament prophets, when they prophesied about what was coming, the first coming of the Lord, even the suffering of Messiah, uh, even the second coming of Messiah, even though they may not have realized they were prophesying about the second coming of Messiah, they did not foresee the church. You know, the Bible tells us that the mystery of Christ now has been revealed. What was once a mystery about the redemption of man through Jesus and the church as a part of that mystery has now been revealed. And so what they didn't see, you know, we're living out today. And so they didn't see the church and therefore they didn't foresee the rapture the rapture was a revelation that God gave the apostle Paul after the Gentiles were grafted in the covenant because the Gentiles, right. it, that the covenant of Abraham being extended to the Gentiles is a part of that mystery of Christ that was not foreseen completely by Old Testament prophets. So Paul is the one that God gives this revelation to about the rapture. And that's why it's specifically for the church. The promise of the rapture is to God's church. And that's why it's so important. You're talking about being faithful and overcoming. I think just being connected to church is such a critical thing because when we assemble together, um, it's a picture of the rapture. When we assemble together in worship, of course, we're not able to do that fully right now because of the situation. But uh, you see when, when God's people assemble in church together in worship, it is a picture of us being gathered together to meet the Lord in the air. But here's what Paul said, but I don't want you to be ignorant brethren. And we need to add the sister in, in there. Come on, somebody. So, <laughs> that's the, uh, that's my version, Pastor Fred. But I don't want you to be ignorant. You mentioned this verse, brethren, concerning those who've fallen asleep. So the Thessalonians, the whole book of Thessalonians, which is Paul's first book, was written because the Thessalonian believers were worried that their loved ones who had served God had died are not going to be able to make the rapture. And so he's answering that question. And so he says, uh, lest you sorrow as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so I think that what we have to realize is this is not a revelation that, God, that the Old Testament prophets had. This was something that God was giving to Paul for the church. And what's interesting is that like when you look at, you and I were talking yesterday about Matthew 24, when the disciples asked Jesus about, tell us the signs of the times and the time of the end. Well, Jesus starts to, he starts to go in to describe the tribulation. If you, if you actually take the book of Revelation and you lay it across what Jesus said, Jesus gave a, like a uh, miniature timeline of the events of the tribulation, but you got to remember who his audience was. He's talking to Jewish men who have no idea that the church is going to be born, and uh, they have no idea of any kind of concept of a rapture, and even after they're used to start the church, they still don't understand the fullness of the gospel, and they still had no idea of a rapture. It wasn't until Paul comes along that God gives this revelation of a rapture, and that's why I think it was probably difficult for many of the apostles in the early days to wrap their mind around some of the teachings of Paul because uh, they still had their predisposed ideas from their religious backgrounds. Yeah, there's a scripture in Peter. It's in First or Second Peter, and Peter's somewhat implying that he he doesn't have a full understanding. I forget what verse that is. He said, well, the things that Paul teaches are difficult to understand, but he said they're true. It's like his spirit knew they were true. Right, exactly. Uh, and it's also interesting that he, he's, Jesus is telling them this in, in Matthew 24. But still, when he gets to verse 14, he says, the gospel of this kingdom must be preached to all the world as a witness to all the nations. He says, and then the end can come. Uh, in verse 14 of First Thessalonians, he says, even so, if we believe, uh, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Seems like he's echoing what he says in 2 Corinthians 5, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there's that assurance that our loved ones who are uh, deceased now, uh, their house, their, their tent, you know, that's gone back to the earth, but they are present with the Lord. And that's, that's the group that he's talking about. Whenever, whenever it happens, there's going to be a group alive to witness it. Uh, or like you said, a generation alive that will witness that. Right. And those that have passed, as Paul says, he will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, it appears that he's talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Mm -hmm. so, so he's letting us know in, in that verse, whenever that day comes, there, there are going to be those who had not experienced sleep. And of course, sleep is, is referring to the death of the saints. Right. And he says, in a moment in the twinkling of, of an eye at the last trumpet, and the trumpet was mentioned in First Thessalonians. He says, uh, um, the dead will be raised incorruptible. We shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this has happened, uh, just paraphrasing a bit, he says, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Um, so would you say, because it appears to me that what he's saying here in 1 Corinthians 15 is echoing what he was saying in 1 Thessalonians 4. Right, absolutely. You know, and he talks about the twinkling of an eye and uh, in an instant. And, and, and I think that what's so interesting is that, you know, one of the things that Paul is he lays out the sequence of events of how the rapture is going to take place, you know, and he said the rapture shout. And so what is the purpose of the rapture? Well, it's to save the church from the wrath that is to come because in the next chapter, Paul mentions the fact that, Hey, God has not appointed us for the wrath that is to come. And we know throughout the scripture, you know, the tribulations referred to as the wrath of God. And uh, so we know that we haven't been appointed for the wrath that is to come. And so the purpose of the rapture is to save the church from the wrath that's coming but it's also, and this is what's awesome, Pastor, is to give us a body that's suitable for eternity. And so right. we, we see that you're giving a glorified body. So whatever G Jesus was born, he came to the earth as the first, as the only begotten son, right? For God told the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everybody refers to him as the only begotten son. But he didn't leave the earth that way. He left the earth, the Bible says, as the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, meaning that he was born again. And because he was born again, we now are able to be born again. And the 
that we, we see that Jesus is still today in that glorified body. You know, he came through the wall, uh, but he was still touchable, right? And uh, he ate food with the, uh, the disciples. And so I think that what we see is um, in, when we pass in this life now, our, our, the spirits of our, our loved ones and our fellow believers there in heaven with the Lord, but they're not giving their body. And that's what you're talking about earlier about the reward is because when we face the judgment slash reward, you're going to be given your crown. You, put, you don't put a crown on the spirit, but you do put a crown on a physical body. And they're going to be given those bodies back. And we see a picture of the rapture in Lazarus, right? Paul said it with the trumpet blast and the shout. He said it, in, uh, he said it here in 1 Thessalonians. He said it in Corinthians, as you were mentioning. Notice what Jesus did. He, 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 he shouted out and said, Lazarus, come forth. And it was the very audible voice, shout of God that reached into death and snatched Lazarus out of the grave. And the rapture will be just like that. It'll be that sh the rapture shout that will physically snatch us away from this earth. But this is the miraculous part of God. This is why into teaching on this stuff is so exciting. Our dead loved ones, even those who've been dead for centuries, their bodies disintegrated. It's like they're going to take on molecular form again and be in right. a glorified body. It's just really an amazing, just an amazing thing. And I think that's a part of the mystery of Christ that was hidden for centuries that Paul said now has been revealed to us. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you mentioned uh, the, the crowns and we see in scripture, um, you know, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life. There are, there appears to be uh, some requirements, you know, the crown of life, you know, he who endures temptation, mm -hmm. uh, the crown of glory appears to be a crown for individuals like you and I, you know, shepherd the flock of God. So, but then I think of first Corinthians chapter three, uh, starting with verse nine, you know, when he talks about where, where his fellow workers, where God's building, where God's field. And then he goes on and starts to talk about works. He, he mentions precious stones and then he mentions wood, stubble and hay. And as you continue to read, it, it appears he talks about works that may be works that may be burned, though he is he himself is still saved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've always I've always believed that to be. Uh, what he was talking about in second corinthians 5 10 there will be some that give an account for bad deeds it's not it's not a it's not a frightening thing in that if you're giving giving an account for bad deeds if those bad deeds number up so much then you're no longer counted worthy to to, to enter in i i think people kind of have that feeling like you know what, what had happened bad deeds outweigh my good deeds i mean probably all kinds of thoughts running through their head all right Right. Yeah, and I think the jewels too possibly could be the right. souls, the souls that you, the soul winner's crown. You know, the souls that you impacted for Christ. Yeah, um, he says, give an account for the deeds done in the body. He says, whether good or bad. Mm -hmm. Ephesians two ten says, we are his workmanship, uh, created for good works that we should walk in them. So we we've been called. You know, good works don't save us. But because we're saved, we've been called to, you know, do good works and do good deeds. And so I agree with you uh, on that. And then those deeds would be, you know, uh, ministering to the lost. I believe those deeds have to do with, you know, visiting those in prison, visiting those who are sick, yeah, et cetera. Right. And your kingdom. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether the deeds equate. I mean, I believe the deeds ha do have to do with uh, the jewels. And I don't know if the jewels are for the crown i recently read somewhere where the crown is more like a wreath you know that's what's being implied but you know regardless we we, we clearly we see this day of rewards and we're thinking you know imagine that your worst case scenario is that you're still saying what a reward even in that mm -hmm. right and um you know we're when you're talking about Jesus, he physically in his in his glorified state still ate breakfast and food with the disciples. You know, we'll be a part of a marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's not a just a figurative. We we, we often apply allegorical ideas to the Bible, but it's also literal. We're you know in a glorified state. I mean, hey, we're going to be having a party, and it's going to be a celebration uh, for seven years, which I think will coincide with seven year tribulation. But hey, we're talking about Pastor the difference between the the rapture of the church and the second coming. And you made a mention of this earlier, and that is that the word rapture is not in the Bible. So people, if they look through the scriptures, they're not going to find that word. But when Jerome, 
uh, St. Jerome translated the Bible from, from Greek into Latin, which became the Latin Vulgate. He used this word in Thessalonians that Paul used. Uh, he used the, the it's, it's a hypothesis, a Greek word, which means to snatch away. He replaced right. it with the Latin counterpart, which is rapturo. And his, his work became so famous, the Latin Vulgate. It went on centuries later to become the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. But it just kind of stuck. And it's just become this word describing the same thing. So we know today when we think of rapture, even though it's not in our English Bible, the idea of the snatching away of the church is there. And I wanted to read uh, Titus uh, to you, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. This is where it helps us to understand uh, the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. I think that's a part of being faithful and overcoming right? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And why? Because we're, you know, we're living for the age to come. And he said, here's why. And he goes on to say, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So here you even see Paul telling us that he, he's creating a delineation, right? The blessed hope that's coming in the rapture and the glorious appearing uh, which is the second coming of the Lord. You know, the, Jesus is not necessarily appearing in the rapture. The Bible tells us that he's coming in the, Paul said he's going to come and descend from heaven into the clouds. And it's the rapture shout, like what pulled Lazarus out of the grave is going to pull us into the air to meet the Lord. But in the second coming is going to be this glorious appearing when the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation at the battle of Armageddon to defeat the Antichrist and to set up his millennial reign. Hmm. Yeah, see, that's probably eye-opening uh, for a lot of people because the scripture talks about all I will be able to see him. So instead of talking about the, the receiving of the church, or is that talking about his, his coming? Mm -hmm. And it, it probably has more to do, I mean, I would think would have to, more to do with his coming, uh, you know, when he returns to, like you said, engage the Antichrist. Right. Uh, very eye-opening. Yeah, so it's the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. So there are yeah. two different events that Paul's talking about. The blessed hope of the rapture and the glorious appearing of the Lord in the second coming. And, you know, what separates those two events? The seven-year tribulation. So when you understand that what the Bible tells us in Revelation is about when the Lord returns to the earth, because in the rapture, he's not physically returning to the earth. He's just going into the clouds to call us home, right? But right. in he returns to the earth. He's specifically coming to confront the Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon. And that's why there cannot be, these two things cannot be a simultaneous, you know, Jesus coming back in the rapture. They're not the same events. Right. And, and appearing and coming, that's, that's eventually what I learned was the difference, mm -hmm. you know, where we where where everyone thought that the rapture and the coming was the same event, but we're talking about an appearing that's probably a, 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 a simple way to explain it. There's going to be an appearing. Mm -hmm. That's for us. And then there's going to be a coming when he's uh, uh, engaging the Antichrist in the Battle of Armageddon. So, yeah, that's, it's, uh, there's comfort in that. Absolutely. It's, it's exciting. And, you know, um, even, in, even when you read Matthew 24, when Jesus is really outlining the tribulation, uh, people will talk about at the end of that where he, he begins, God's going to gather up his people, right? And they'll try to attribute the rapture to that. But um, Jesus is describing an ingathering of people that the angels said the angels will come and gather God's people from the four corners of the earth. Uh, that's a very different kind of description than what Paul described the rapture as. You know, the rapture right. is that shout that snatches you away. And so Jesus isn't talking about in Matthew 24, again, the rapture of the church, because again, who is he talking to? He's talking to Jewish guys who don't yet know there's going to be a church and they don't yet know anything about a rapture. Very true. And then, and then that even goes into when you, when you read um, Matthew 25, which immediately follows, as you're reading it, this, it doesn't sound like the rapture. You know, it doesn't sound like uh, the events that would involve, you know, him snatching us, him receiving his church and, uh, and heading to the Bema. So, um, yeah, for, for me, that was, that was, uh, that was liberating and it was very, and it was comforting because, you know, oftentimes revelation is like a doom and gloom message, you know, right. be afraid, um, you know, that, that dreadful day, but 
but in, in, in actuality, how could it be dreadful for his people? Right, you know, and, and for those watching, you know, when we talk about pre-tribulation, you know, and sometimes people will joke pastors it's like, I know people talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, but I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. I'm a pan-trib, you know, I believe it's all going to pan out. But for the sake of the those watching, right. you know, a pre-tribulation rapture means that we believe in, in that the rapture of the church is going to take place before the tribulation. And it's going to be the thing that's going to give rise to the Antichrist to enact the tribulation. And secondly, the mid-trib is that it's going to happen because we know the tribulation is a seven-year period of time made up of two, three and a half years so there's people that'll they'll, they'll say that, well, the, the, the mid-trib is when, in the middle of the tribulation, the church will be raptured, and then the post-trib is that it all happens at one time at the end. But we're just here to say that the Bible is pretty clear uh, in how it describes it if you understand the difference between the rapture and second coming, that it is a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, Dr. Sutton, he taught that, you know, there will be uh, a a receiving at the midpoint and at the end, but that's not us. That's right. That's right. Well, the, the, again, there's, there will be other souls, you know? Yeah. Right. The different kinds of saints, the, the tribulation right. saints, the new Testament saints, exactly. Those who decided that they're going to serve God and not serve the antichrist. Many of them will be killed and martyred. But you know, another thing too, uh, pastor, that is, is an important point for Christians to understand when Jeremiah prophesied of the tribulation, he said it's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. That's how he described it, a time of, of Jacob's trouble. And, you know, when you look at the New Testament, um, uh, you know, because a lot of times you know, people are like, well, we don't believe in replacement theology. And I don't either. You know, God has a plan for the church, and he has a plan for Israel. The church hasn't replaced Israel. But at the same time, we can't, when it comes to the end times, create our own combination theology as well. Like the church has to have, you know, the church did not reject Messiah. The church has accepted Messiah. And there is the promise of the rapture. But Israel will go through this time of tribulation. You know, the, the angel goes into detail with Daniel about how his people, because Daniel is, is praying and seeking God about the future of his people and how they will go through these times. When Jeremiah described them as a time of Jacob's sorrow. And, you know, Jacob, the, the, the people of Israel is always associated with Jacob because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But in the New Testament, Paul always links us to Abraham. He said, because of our faith in Jesus, we're the seed of Abraham. So if the church and Christians were ordained or appointed, that Paul said, we're not appointed for the wrath to come, but if we were appointed for the, for the tribulation, then wouldn't he have said it would be a time of Abraham's trouble? That's a good point. No, that, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so there's the scripture uh, in Revelation 20 that says, uh, blessed is he who takes part in the first resurrection. Uh, do you believe that that's talking about what we've been reading in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Corinthians 4? Because it says, blessed is he who takes part over this, over, in which over the second death will, or have no part over them. So the second death is not a concern to those that are a part of the first resurrection. Right. I mean, you know, we, we see uh, even at the end uh, of uh, after the millennial reign, there's going to be another resurrection where everyone, everyone's dead bodies, everyone who ever lived, their dead body will be raised. And, and those who did wickedness, they'll be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. So there's multiple resurrections. Right. And, but we see that the rapture of the church is, is something that's unique. That's why it's, man, such a, what a joy it is to serve God. This age of grace, this age of the Holy Spirit, this church age is this unique time that, that was a hidden and a mystery. You know, you always hear preachers preach about God. I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, heard the good things that God has for those who, who, who love him. But Paul said, but God has revealed them to us by his yeah. spirit. You know, in Isaiah, Paul was quoting Isaiah. In Isaiah's day, I hadn't seen, ear hadn't fully understood these things. It was a mystery. But the mystery of Christ has been revealed. That's why it's such a joy to be a Christian and to serve God and to be a part of his church. And Paul talks about, I mean, he talks about the mystery in Ephesians and Colossians and in, in, in first Corinthians. So, um, so yeah, for us as believers uh, in Christ, that mystery, that mystery has been revealed. And I guess I just want to reiterate that, that it's, 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 it's a joyous occasion, you know, now, now we do. And I think some believers get tribulation and the tribulation mixed up. Right. Like we as believers will go through tribulation. Absolutely. In this world, you're not talking about that seven year period of tribulation that, you know, many think 
I, you know, I think they get them mixed up. Right. And so there needs to be, you know, clarity and explanation on the difference between just the general tribulations of believers, the things that we just go through in life, you know, yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, and the seven year tribulation. Right. Absolutely. You know, I, I was going to say real quickly too in Ezekiel, chapter twenty four uh, in, in Ezekiel uh, forty three. Excuse me. He prophesied about the coming of Messiah, and, he, and which we know is the second coming. And he said he's going to go through the eastern gate, which, by the way, was the same gate he, he entered uh, through um, when he, in, the, in the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But he, he talks about how he's going to come. He's going to enter through that eastern gate. And he's going to set up his reign on earth. We know that Jesus didn't establish his his kingdom in its fullness when he came first. You know, it's going to come in its fullness at his at, at the second coming. But here, but you see that when people try to lump, hey, that is a post tribulation rapture that we're going to, have to go through the tribulation. Well, then, then uh, Paul describes the rapture event very very differently than this. Ezekiel is saying when he comes and he touches down. He is going to go through that eastern gate victorious over the Antichrist. And he's going to set up a reign. That's a very different scenario than the rapture. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for this, this back and forth and this, and this discussion because, you know, I haven't given, I mean, I've given myself to a lot of study uh, in Scripture and the Word, but Revelation was just always something that I, you know, I'd, I'd leave it alone or I'd touch on it a little bit. So I appreciate you know, the, the, the time that you've given to it, because I'm learning just like those that are watching are learning right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I'm, I'm, I'm doing this verse by verse on uh, Tuesday night. So, you know, I plan to really, you know, come face to face with a lot of information and truth regarding the end that, you know, either I, I, I had not heard before, or maybe I'd heard it before, but I didn't really have a familiarity, a familiarity with it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, looking at the words of the of the prophets, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, I mean, they all all touch on of course the book of Daniel. So uh, but I appreciate the time that you've given to it because you know there's there's much that I'm learning right now. Yeah, well, you know, I, I just want to encourage people that, you know, we don't have to fear uh, the wrath that's coming in the tribulation. You know, a lot of people are asking now, are we in the beginning of sorrows? Is this the beginning? You know, because Jesus talked about plagues and pestilences and is COVID-19 the beginning of that? Are we entering the tribulation? I want to tell you, no, we're not because the rapture of the church hasn't taken place. Uh, I think we are getting a glimpse of what the tribulation will be like. This is a test run, a trial run, a beta test, possibly. Uh, and it's giving you a picture uh, of things that are coming, economic decline, all the things that we see in the book of Revelation but I think it is exciting, like you were saying, we're told to comfort one another with these words, Paul said, you know, yeah. and how can it be a comfort if it's a post-tribulation? You know, why would we be faithful and be overcoming, like we were talking about earlier, and then have to suffer the same fate of the, <laughs> of an unrepentant, unbelieving world? It doesn't even, it doesn't even, it, it, it doesn't even, uh, it's not even congruent with the nature of God. No, oh, another good point. So when, do you believe, though, in a general sense, in Matthew 24, you know, when when they asked about the signs and asked about when the end's coming, that, and he says wars and rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes, famines. Do you believe that he was talking about a specific time that he would see and hear? I mean, he even says, he says, nation arise against nation. And he says kingdom against kingdom. Absolutely. So, well, yeah. You know, is it is it is it kind of twofold in that he, he was specifically talking about a certain time, but then in a general sense, you know, from the time that he made that statement up until the rapture of the church, we would see these signs. Right. Well, I think what you said in the beginning was that we've been in the last days from the time Jesus rose. You know, one one thing that's interesting is that when when Jesus ascended into heaven on the Mount of Olives, the disciples are still looking up. He's already disappeared. And they're still looking up <laughs> and the angel comes and says, guys, you know, I'm paraphr I'm putting it in a very uh, common Brad Sullivan, uh, you know, Southern vernacular, but he's like, guys, you know, why do you stand here gazing? Um, he said, uh, just like you saw him leave, he's going to return. And so that's the second coming, right? He's going to return. So until then go and do what he's told you to do. But here's what's, here's what they knew according to old, again, you're talking about Jewish guys who don't yet know fully about the church. They certainly don't know about the rapture, but they know Old Testament prophecy that in his second, that in his coming, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives and he's going to go through that Eastern gate. 
and they're standing on the Mount of Olives. It's almost like they're standing there waiting for God to do a U-turn and come back down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, I mean, it's interesting how, how, how ready they were for, you know, this thing to come to an end. Right. From the time of his, of his resurrection. And so once again, you know, they asked that question, okay, so you're, you're, you're restoring Israel now, right? Like, okay, this is happening. Right. Before he's like, he's asking it, when he's risen, they're asking it and they're still saying they're right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So he's like, nah, that's, that's the father knows that. Right. It's for him to know the times and the seasons you go forth in power, mm -hmm. preach right. the gospel. Right. Win souls. You know, that was their, that was their, 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 their primary, um, uh, marching order. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is, a uh, definitely something, you know, that, that believers need to know and, and we need to be comforted and, and with all of the signs, I mean, you know, COVID and coronavirus has, uh, hogged the, the, uh, headlines, but other things have been occurring that we've seen before, but I mean, they're occurring during coronavirus and people are probably, you know, that much more nervous than before like okay it must be right around the corner right. but I, I i like to consider other scriptures um like you brought some clarity to me regarding sitting at my right hand until i make your enemies your footstool we have scriptures like uh, ephesians 4 um beginning with verse 1 all the way through verse 16 but focusing in on verse 11 where the scripture says that ministry gifts were given you know he gave some to be these particular ministry gifts. And he said, the reason that they were given is so that the saints would be equipped for the work of ministry, mm -hmm. for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then that until word pops up, like until we all come to the unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like, like the Bible was saying, either something can't happen or something will happen when we come to the unity of the faith. Uh, do you believe the unity of the faith? And I, I don't, completely know what that looks like. following verses describe a mature body, you know, not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and the, the craftiness and, and deceitfulness of men. Um, and it talks about every joint supplying and, and, and every part doing its share. So clearly that's, that's the body uh, aligned with the head. But do you believe all of that, all of that plays a part in, in the end, uh, plays a part in uh, yeah. the, the day of the rapture coming? Absolutely, because, you know, Jesus commissioned them as apostles, right? And we know that in John 20, it's interesting, you know, uh, we're coming up with the day of Pentecost, when uh, Adam walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day, in the Hebrew, it means in the wind of the day, actually. So we know that it was uh, the wind of God's presence coming that he knew was God, all right? So what is God? What, so, and, and we also know he knew this wind because the Lord breathed into his breath, the, the breath his nostrils, the breath of life, right? So what do we see? You see this breath restored and you see John in John 20, the apostles, they, they received, they're, they're commissioned as apostles even before they even have a full revelation of the church, right? And Jesus breathes on them to receive the Holy Spirit. And then you see the wind coming back in on the day of Pentecost, right? Mm -hmm. So you see it kind of bookends. You see this wind of the spirit, the wind of God's presence being restored. But the point in saying that is to that he said, I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age, right? And I think that uh, at those gifts, I don't know if it's a statute of limitation in terms of like, you know, until we get to this point where there's unity, because, uh, but, uh, you know, complete, there'll always be some differences. But right. I, I think that what he's talking about is just building the church up, unifying the church. But you're, you're going to do this throughout all time until the end of the age. We know that end of the age will be highlighted by the rapture. Yeah. yeah. But, Go ahead. Huh? Were you going to say something else? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so, so that until word, that until word always, uh, it's always intrigued me. You know, and we see the the until pop up a few places. There's a scripture in in Acts, chapter three, verse twenty one, and 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 actually Mark. Let me let me focus on Mark sixteen first, um, in describing uh, his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Uh, Mark articulates that heaven has that heaven received him, heaven received him, and then Acts three twenty one says, referring to the Christ, and this is this is Peter preaching, and he says. Uh, whom heaven must receive, 
whom heaven must receive until the restoration of all things. Uh, what is that? What, what is the restoration of all things? Um, you know, can we say concretely what that is? And when it says heaven must receive him, does that mean heaven will receive him before he comes or before he appears? Or do we know? Heaven must receive him before he comes or before he appears. Right. In other words, it says heaven must receive him until the restoration of all things. So the restoration of all things has to take place. And then it's like the scripture is saying, then heaven can release him. And so is that releasing referring well, to, you know, the appearing and him just receiving the church? Or is it referring to like Psalm 1101, you know, his coming? Well, you know, Jesus even talked about until the time of the Gentiles is complete. Right. And uh, I think that part of that is the church age, you know. Um, at the completion of that, it's kind of like, uh, you know, at times of judgment are complete once it's like the, the Bible always talks about, you know, like it always refers to as a cup of judgment. It always refers you know, a lot of times it refers to as a cup of judgment where it's like the cup is being filled and there's mercy, there's opportunity until it gets full. Then, then that time has lapsed. Right. And so it's, um, I don't, I don't mean to put it in a negative judgment way. I'm just saying it's like until the time of the Gentiles is complete and the fullness of that time has come, just like when the fullness of time had come, Christ is born. Well, I think the fullness of this time is, is coming. And that's why those gifts that you were talking about were reaching that point of unity and maturity, a glorified church to the age of the Gentile is complete. And then these things come forth. So then can we also plug in uh, blindness in part has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in? Right, obviously. The, I, think, I think Jesus said that, you know? Yeah. Right. Okay. Good stuff. Well, Good stuff. Know, uh, as we're getting ready to wrap up, Pastor, I, I would just want to encourage the people, too. You know, we're talking about the difference between the rapture and the end times, is that, you know, it's an, it, I, I really believe in the pre tribulation rapture of the church, and I think the Bible is clear. But when, when you understand that compared to like Matthew 24 and the tribulation, it's more imminent, you know, like, uh, when you were, you were reading earlier about 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talked about it in a twinkling of an eye. And so I think one of the things that get people confused is that when they talk about the signs of the times, um, they, they think that in order for the rapture to take place, certain events have to transpire, right? But I, I just want to bring a clarification. But because the rapture and the second coming are two different events, uh, the rapture is an imminent event that Paul describes as happening in the twinkling of an eye, but for the, for the second coming of the Lord to, to, for his appearing, for his return to the earth, there has to be certain signs that take place. Right. Right. And that's, that's always been something that I've taught that there, there are some things that just, they have to be in place. Right. Um, and so I've, I've always, you know, thought about Ephesians 4.13 and thought about Matthew 24, you know, 14 and Romans 11.26, those scriptures. Be preached in before the Gentiles and, um, you know, us coming to the unity of the faith, the restoration of all things. I believe all of that ties in, ties in together. Right. Well, so yeah. should we, should we do some, some questions or yeah. do we have any questions you think or? And did we get to the last question? I mean, I think I think we did. Are we in the beginning of the tribulation? Right. Yeah, I think you, I think you answered that one. Well, I mean, if you have any thoughts, you want to mention that. Somebody asked us about uh, what about Matthew twenty four, uh, the Olivet Discourse, which I think you know, we've kind of answered that. For those of you who are watching, the Olivet Discourse is basically a theological term used to describe the conversation, basically that Jesus had on the Mount of Olives with the disciples about the end, where he describes the tribulation. If you want to go into that. Uh, no, you've, 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 I think you handled that well. One thing that we didn't touch on though is, uh, he says, see that you're not troubled. I think we need to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. Right. See that you're not troubled. Uh, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, someone asks, have you made it? I think we answered that one. Yeah. Yeah. You made it. <laughs> hey, here's a question, Pastor Price. That's uh, the place you want to be. What, what is the title of Pastor Price's book? I don't know. <laughs> you, oh, wow. find that, you find that also in Matthew 25, if you keep reading. <laughs> Actually, I, I mean, I guess I do have a copy here behind the scene. Come on. Look at that. 
Yeah. Uh, so behind the scene, S E E N, referring to the scene realm. The supernatural realm behind the layer of the natural. And then there's a question about this is like, how do you explain the idea of the rapture that is secret when Paul mentions how loud it will be? So I had a, uh, that's interesting. I had that question for you as well because 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 both mention the trumpet. Right. And then also with the voice of an archangel. Well, I don't think it's a secret because we're talking about the rapture. What I, I, I think what I, was, what I was referring to was that um, what was hidden in the mystery before Jesus has now been revealed to us, right? And so what I was referring to, and so if I said something that alluded to it being a secret, obviously, you know, it's the, rap, uh, it's the rapture shout heard around the world, you know? I mean, you know, was Jesus, the Bible says that when Jesus cried out to Lazarus, it was with a loud voice. Right. And so it's the, it's the rapture shout and the blast of the trumpet. Now, I think there is an interesting question. Will the world hear it or will it be only a shout that is heard by God's I people? Think that's, I think that's the question. Ultimately. Right. But in terms of it being a secret, it was it was it was a part of the mystery of Christ that was hidden for centuries. That Paul said has now been revealed to us. And uh, and right. notice it was revealed specifically to Paul. Right. So uh, Paul was only in Thessalonica for three weeks. And he start, established the church. He obviously had done a whole gamut of teaching in three weeks. That his first letter to this very infant church, first letter he contributes to the New Testament, is about the rapture. So he's teaching this revelation. And, and I just meant the fact that it was a secret in terms of not understood by the Old Testament prophets, but as being it was revealed uh, once the Gentiles were grafted into, into the covenant. Well, I think I think it would be fitting to discuss this then because. You know, he writes uh, to the Thessalonian believers and in the second epistle, you know, there's the concern that some of them had, you know, d d did I miss it or will I miss it? And he says, you know, by no means. And so here's the scripture where, you know, there's a lot of this, a lot of discussion about, you know, what the great falling away uh, means. And of course, when you just go with that Greek word, you get a, a, a massive forsaking or a massive, what appears to be a turning away from the faith, but there's something that you shared with me that I thought was very powerful that I think the people would uh, would uh, benefit from when you talked about uh, the word limitations. Right, mistranslations. Well, I was just saying that, you know, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, um, Paul is answering the questions to the Thessalonians, have, have our, will our dead loved ones make the rapture? And so he's right. explaining that, so he goes into detail, he outlines the sequence of how the rapture is going to take place. But then in 2 Thessalonians, they're freaked out because someone circulated a letter in Paul's name saying right. that the rapture rate took place. And now they're living in the tribulation. And they're like, they're panicked. Right. <laughs> like we all would be if we um, exactly. thought that. And so what he does is he explains in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, th those events. And he, and he talks about, he said, look, I want to comfort you with this. Don't, don't, be, don't be concerned. He said, these things can't come first until the apostasia, right? It's the Greek word apostasia. And so what happened was um, uh, when the King James Version was translated from, from Greek into, into English, they transliterated the word apostasy into English, uh, apostasia from Greek into English apostasy. But you, you and I were having a conversation that a Greek word can have multiple meanings where an English word only has one. Right. So the word apostasy in English only means falling away from a faith that you once had. But in Greek, the word apostasia means disappearance. It can mean a departure. It doesn't just mean a departure from a faith. It actually means a, it can mean a departure from a space. Right. And so when you understand the context of what Paul has saying in Second Thessalonians, he said, look, these the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the man of sin, cannot rise. These things cannot come until first there is the disappearance. That's essentially what he's saying. But because the King James Version, they, they transliterated it into aposta, apostasy, it gives this idea of this great falling away. And it's become a part of the end time narrative. Like there has to be this mass exodus and this chaos and rebellion that this, the Antichrist rises in. But if you understand the context of what Paul's saying, he's saying these things can't come until there is the di disappearance or the departure of the church. You know, of the 15 times the word apostasia is used in the New Testament, uh, only three is it referring to falling away from a faith. Twelve times it's used in referring to leaving a space. 
And so I think that's a very important understanding. And the, there were seven English Bibles that predated the King James Version. And in all seven of those Bibles, they all put the word departing. They understood, uh, even Jerome in his Latin Vulgate, he understood that Paul was talking about a departure from the earth, uh, not a falling away from the faith. Not that there won't be great apostasy, but in the New Testament, Paul refers to apostasy as a something that grows gradually over time. Like you were saying earlier, the difference between going through the tribulation and having tribulations in this earth, right? And so... Um, so I think that's really important. And that's another, I think, case that builds for the pre-tribulation rapture is understanding that Paul's talking about the disappearance of the church in that passage and all the previous seven Bibles of, uh, in English that predated King James, they understood that. Well, that explanation makes sense. And, and, and it, it helps the scripture not to appear to be contradicting itself, which we know it, it doesn't, but sometimes there is that appearance and we just need to dig a little deeper and get some clarity. And then it makes sense too, because he says, you know, uh, don't be shaken in mind. I mean, he's comforting them. There, there, there always seems to be this comfort that he's bringing God's people regarding, uh, you know, uh, the end right. and, and us being um, uh, received by our Savior. So how does post-tribulation rapture comfort you? It just doesn't. Right. And, exactly. And it's true. And, and, it's I would, true. and I would say this, too. You know, Paul referred to, you mentioned earlier, and, and, and we'll get ready to close if there's no other questions, but... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he talked about that. In the twinkling of an eye, no man knows the day or the hour. But, you know, when it comes to the, the hasty, that's the rapture. But when it comes to the second coming, the book of Revelation, which you're teaching through right now, it tells us exactly when the second coming of the Lord is going to happen. That is the, 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 at the end of the tribulation. You know, once yeah. the Antichrist defiles the temple, <laughs> once the Antichrist sets himself up as God in that second three and a half years, enacts the beast system and sets up the mark of the beast. Everyone has to worship his image. We know from scripture that 42 months from that day, Jesus is going to come back three and one half years. Amen. 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 And, uh, awesome. I'm sorry. One last question, pastor. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just here. I'm just along for the ride. You're, you're <laughs> What's here in the driver's seat? No, I move over. I hope. Would it be safe to say Christ? Would it be safe to see or say Christ's resurrection is God, God's atoning? I mean, I don't. The atoning yeah. of Christ was the the, the shed blood uh, of of Jesus. Yeah. And uh, well, I guess the whole thing, <laughs> death, burial, and resurrection, is his atoning work. Hopefully but that's what they it, But it's bringing it to a completion in the rapture, you know? Yeah. So, well, Pastor, we love you, man. And uh, we appreciate you. And uh, uh, just as we were closing, there, there, there's been a lot of people saying that, you know, are we, are we in the beginning of sorrows? I mean, you know, what, what are your thoughts? You know, is COVID-19, coronavirus, are we in the beginning of I know you've been doing a series on uh, the signs before the signs, which is a really awesome title. Yeah. Yeah, I just finished that up in the signs before the signs led into uh, this this teaching on Revelation. But I mean, I honestly, which I wish I could have had a conversation with you, because I think uh, that that appetizer teaching uh, probably would have gone a little bit differently. Um, but that's the thing about, you know, having fellowship like this and iron sharpening iron. But when you know, when I think of of. In, in light of what you shared regarding Matthew 24, I, I, I like the words test run because if what Jesus was saying was in relation to the seven year tribul tribulation, the beginning of sorrows, then, then I would say no, because we're not there yet. But all of the things that he mentioned, we've seen for quite some time. So uh, right. for sure, it's, it's, it's as if, and it's likened to the beginning of sorrows because all of those things we have, We've heard about our history uh, tells us about those things. Our present tells us about those things. Wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilence, famine, you know, weather, et cetera. So uh, I, I, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the beginning of sorrows, but it is, it's like a, a preview, you know, of a coming attraction. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a, 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 an opening behind the scene of like what your book is talking about, you know, and yeah. the word apocalypse, 
you know, I think Hollywood and media gives people the wrong idea about the word apocalypse because we think about the apocalypse as the end of days, right? The end of time. But really the word apocalypse just simply means an unveiling or a revealing. And I think that what we're seeing is that, uh, this is apocalyptic times in which we live, but it's not the end of days, but it is a revealing. It's an unveiling. I think what this done, thing has done is expose, it's exposed globalism. And if you think about how quickly uh, this virus has spread to nations around the world, you know, we know that uh, very quickly the Antichrist will seize power over the globe. And uh, I think that it also has, you know, it's given rise to the surveillance state like never before. Now you're talking about tracking and tracing and all these things that, uh, you know, now you have uh, drones that are monitoring populations in different states. You know, they're going to know where you are constantly at all time. And so I think what we're wa watching is the acceleration of a beast system that the Antichrist will use. And I think in that, that's been an unveiling of, you know, the, 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 the uh, bricks that are being laid in the foundation for what's going to come. Yeah, I concur. Couldn't have said it better. All right. Well, hey, let's just close with this. I'm gonna, I want you to pray for the people and for the church, but I'm going to close with this last verse just to comfort people. Again, First Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, but you, brethren, because you've mentioned that a lot, the comfort and consolation, that we know in the rapture, but you, brethren, and come on, and sister, and we're going to get the ladies in there. Right. You, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, come on, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is so good. You know, G you know, the Bible tells us it's going to come like a thief in the night, Jesus said. And Paul said, like a twinkling of an eye. But you know what? We have a choice. I want people that are watching, we, you have a choice to make. Serve God while it is, while you can. Because when the rapture takes place, it's going to come in the twinkling of an eye for those who are looking for it. But it's going to come like a thief in the night for those who weren't ready. Don't let it be a thief in the night moment in your life. Let it be in the twinkling of an eye and you go on to glory and to great reward with God. Amen, Pastor. Wow. Father, we do thank you and we praise you for this time in which we can uh, come together in, in this uh, unique format via technology uh, where you're glorified, where we can uh, look into your word and, and, and be enriched and, and have our spirits fed. And, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for ministering as you have. Uh, during this time. Uh, I thank you for uh, our understanding of uh, the end times. As Peter said, we've been in the last days uh, since the inception of the church, uh, but it's nothing to be afraid of. It's, it's nothing to be uh, concerned about for those of us uh, that belong to you, Father, in Christ Jesus. And I thank you for the comfort and the, and the consolation that comes as a result of of reading the word and hearing the word and, and understanding the word. And uh, I pray that understanding went forth today, that, that not just knowledge went forth, but understanding of that knowledge for your word says uh, that their understanding had to be open so that they could comprehend the scriptures. And so I thank you for comprehension of the scriptures this day and, and for comfort regarding uh, uh, the end of things. And, and for us, uh, the church being raptured, uh, is, is, it's a high day. Your word says love has been perfected in us so that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is not a frightening day uh, for those of us that are believers, uh, but it is a day of rewards. It is, it is the reward bench. And so uh, we count it an honor and a, and a privilege to be a part of that. Uh, Father, we, we, we rest in you. We rest in the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Uh, uh, every stress and every burden and, and, and weight we give to you because you care so much for us. And so by faith, it's no longer on us. Uh, we're, we're free to move about uh, the country, so to speak. And so I just thank you for everyone who uh, listened today, uh, that the fullness of your blessing uh, is upon us and and we're experiencing it in every facet of our life. We thank you that the angels have been given charge over us, keeping us in all our ways, lest we dash our foot against a stone. Ministering spirits going forth to minister for us who are heirs of salvation. And we give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Pastor, thank you so much. We love you, brother. Give our love to Apostle Price and, 
and, and Dr. Betty Price and all of our friends and family at Crenshaw Christian Center and to Lady Price and to your family. We love you. We appreciate your time. And we want to thank everyone for tuning in. And hey, we're going to come back for part two next week. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. And we'll put out some notifications and topics that we'll be discussing next week. You all be blessed. God bless you, Pastor. You as well. Give your uh, parents in ministry uh, our love as well. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you.